we entitled this panel the social networking out of the box. That is also a, a title I gave uh, to the chapter of my book, and so I think it's a bit, uh, I mean, I don't want, of course, to impose anything of the book on people, but I thought it was maybe nice to follow a line uh, of disruption. And actually, I would say that uh, for writing this book, these two people here have been a big source of inspiration for me. So we are again in this <laughs> disruptive loop that you know doesn't have a really hierarchy, but it's just a circle of network inspiration. And uh, so this panel um, starts uh, from uh, the subject that I was telling you before. Uh, if uh, we reflect on the discourse, first of all, of what is uh, social networking? Then we could say, and if we reflect on the topic of openness and the rhetoric of decentralization, freedom, and exchange uh, in social media, then uh, we can say that all of these cannot really be fully, fully understood if we don't go back in history to really interesting practice of networking and, uh, and part of the underground scene, not only in Europe, but, but also worldwide. And um, so I'm speaking, for example, on the thread that connects uh, the male art with the newism, Luther Bliss, uh, uh, and also Anonymous today, and uh, the fact that uh, you know, there has been a total combination between analog uh, and uh, digital practices, uh, and uh, maybe these practices also demonstrate that sometimes we don't need the digital at all. And so, so I also would like in this panel to reflect about what is the post-digital, that is a concept that Florian has been also researching on lately. <coughs> and so first of all, I think it's important to go back a bit on the roots to understand uh, uh, in which way we could imagine what a social network is. So, we start first with uh, Vittore Baroni. Um, he's an Italian artist, also a music critic uh, and explorer of counterculture. And uh, since uh, 1977, that by the way has been a really important year in Italy because it was part, I mean, this is a year that everybody remembers because there was a big counterculture movement. Uh, for Vittore, this year was important also because he discovered male art. And uh, he has been organizing uh, since that time, I would say, without any stop <laughs> uh, exhibition and uh, creating publication, collective projects, uh, and uh, also publishing books uh, like the Arte Postale, that has been really an important book, not only for Italian, but also for people abroad, related to the discourse of postal art, and also the mail art uh, guide. And uh, he's also active in the field of visual poetry, sound art, street art, uh, comics. And uh, so I would just like now to leave the yeah. stage to him. Yeah, it's a bit of sort of impossible to uh, introduce the history of Melart. It is very long and complicated in just 20 minutes. So I just tried to give a little taste of what Melart is and I uh, selected the a long series of images which are more or less the same you will see exhibited in the, uh, in the show at the gallery and um, I selected from an archive which is quite extensive because as Tatiana said I discovered the existence of male art in around 1977 through the work of uh, Guglielmo Achille Cavellini who was an Italian um, strange wear artist who was giving out his book for free and he was already inside this network of communication. When I started and I found it such a great idea that uh, in a couple of years I already was corresponding with hundreds of people and then it became thousands and I sort of never stopped because I like this idea of trading material of all sorts and uh, just uh, uh, to clarify a little bit, we call it male art. This name male art has come out of the blue. There is no uh, singular person who have named this movement because uh, probably it has roots in the, in the art history. The, the early um, images we see uh, is uh, from Marcel Duchamp, this uh, from 1916. Uh, it was. Um, Duchamp was in New York and he wanted to send these strange four posters that once connected made a, a, a history without meaning and he sent to the Arensberg, we were just living next floor so he could just have slipped 
the thing underneath their door, but he preferred to mail them. And uh, so this uh, rencontre de dimanche de uh, February 1916 is a sort of uh, uh, early piece of mail art, which I like also because next year will be 100. And one of my uh, life dream is to make a proper uh, show, historical show about mail art that will show the whole history with also, also the different uh, uh, routes that takes in different direction and I'm working on it, it would be nice to have it done next year because it's 100. And then uh, next images you see that even the futurist had uh, started to use creatively the mail uh, Balla used to take commercial <coughs> images of towns and draw over, near, over it, uh, change the monuments. This is a piece by Canjullo where the postcard is divided into various sections where you're supposed to write about things of the heart, uh, things of women and so on. And then this is a letter I received when I started mail art from a very old uh, uh, futurist who was uh, doing aerofuturism and uh, he was used to uh, decorate his envelopes and send his images. And so I, I tried uh, my approach to mail art, uh, since uh, I was a bit of, um, uh, Stuart Tom called me a culture vulture. I like to uh, grab things uh, uh, from the different experiences I, I, I discover <coughs> and take it in my nest and my archive and put everything in order. Everyone has his own obsession, you know? And um, so I was already doing this before I discovered mail art because I think the mail art movement is very much connected to the EP underground, the papers, the beat poetry magazines uh, that were around since the 50s. Uh, and so it, it, it's just an underlying movement of alternative publishing press. In fact, 76, 77 was also the years when punk broke and uh, the do-it-yourself fanzine movement started. And these things all intermix and overlap. And as I was trying to say before, male art is not only about art, because a lot of poetry, writing, uh, music, uh, particularly on cassette. When I started out in the early 80s, uh, it was very popular for musicians to uh, self-produce things on cassette, exchange, Cassette is such an interactive sort of medium because you, if you don't like the music, you can erase it and write over it. And, uh, and so from 1980 to 1987, I had this uh, sub-network called Tracks uh, where uh, I was uh, organizing uh, collective projects. To give just one example that connects me to Ljubljana, uh, I had this idea in uh, 83 to make a compilation of alternative national anthems. So I invited like 20 bands from 20 different countries to record a, a different version of their own national anthem. And for Yugoslavia, which was at the time here, um, I had this, con uh, this contact for a small band who had just put out a cassette called Laiba. So I wrote them and they sent me the national anthem of Yugoslavia done their own way, which was part of the cassette and LP, which I made at the time, and was just one of a hundred different things. This was a sort of catalog we did when we decided that this project was, uh, which was part of a group, Trax was like uh, involving, this is really a index of everyone who participated in it, and over 500 people from around the world participate in this track thing, which had different, let's say, rules from mail art. And also, uh, Luther Blissett, uh, Neoism, all the things you'll see at the show that it's were... It's like uh, <coughs> the... Yeah, this we see just quickly, these are images from the Fluxus group, which is just another of the many um, forefathers of mail art. These are stamps by Alan Wa uh, Robert Watts, you can go on and uh, you see stamps by George Machunas, uh, and then you see this is uh, stationery by Machunas, where you have the envelope as the glow, and the stationery inside, the, the letter page, has got the hand, so it's, it's nice to go together. Yeah, well, this is, these are nice because they are example to show how mail art uh, is really a disrupting thing, because first of all, it's not for sale, it's, not, it's uh, totally alternative to the art gallery market, you don't have to be a professional artist to participate. In fact, uh, usually 
uh, we think that the first, what we dis def define as the first official Maillard show is from 1970 at the Whitney Museum in New York and was organized by uh, Marsha Tucker together with Ray Johnson, this weird uh, uh, link to fluxus but also to pop art, Ray Johnson, often called the, the father of Maillard. What made this a proper Maillard show? The fact that he sent out an open call, an invitation that was uh, reproduced in the um, newspapers, and anybody who sent things at the Whitney Museum, a very prestigious uh, establishment museum, had to be shown. The, no, the rule of Maillard, the unwritten rule, is that there is never uh, um, any form of selection. Everything that arrives is shown in the, in the exhibition. Nothing is returned. The material becomes part of the archive of the person who organized it. But all the participants get in exchange a free documentation that might be a catalog or whatever. So this has been unwritten rules that after 40 years are still going. And this show, this, this particular, uh, this is very nice because it's one of the many flux posters who are really seeing how you can, with a very simple idea, disrupt the, how the, the postal system works. Because this poster is just the same on the two sides. And it's called the postman choice. Because you can address it to different uh, people and put two stamps. And then the postman had to decide, should I send it to Rome or to Berlin? And uh, George Machunas is not shown here, but he made another very nice poster was was made on fly paper. And when he made it, of course, all kind of, of of pieces of mail were inside the postal box would stick to it, so it would uh, really destroy communication. This is another interesting piece, if I Yves Klein, so you see the, the very high uh, history of art, history mingles with mail art, but at the same time mail art is done by thousands and thousands of people, totally unknown, unprofessional, but just for the fun of it, and often their works are much better than those from the famous one. But anyway, this is what did uh, for to promote one exhibition of his in Paris in 1957, as you can see. Uh, Yves Klein, who have created, of course, this famous uh, blue plane uh, color, he bought uh, from the post office all sheets of uh, regular uh, governative stamps and then painted them blue. So when he put the, the stamp on the envelopes, at the same time, he had put the proper stamp, but he had uh, defaced it, and so there was a scandal at the time because uh, um, he actually had bribed the postal worker to have them uh, rubber stamped and mailed. And so probably the guy was fired after that because <laughs> the scandal. Uh, uh, and this is another obscure mail art piece from uh, Trotta, an Italian artist in the 70s. It's also very simple because you have this uh, transparent poster and the title refers to the fact that, that you decide what kind of uh, um, town view you see because uh, of course uh, any place you, see, you put it you would have a different landscape on the poster. This is another sort of historical piece just to show that this history of Milat really goes back. There is uh, Enrico Bai, the uh, artist and pathophysician, uh, has wrote in a book, uh, uh, in one of his books, he made a whole chapter about male art because he liked to play that as well. And he himself thought that the first male art performance was when uh, uh, Cleopatra had Mark uh, Anthony rolled into a carpet and delivered to her. So you see, we can go very back far. These uh, stamps were done by, an in, uh, uh, by a person who was inside a, um, a Nazi prison uh, camp. They didn't have a paper to, to make paintings. He, he could only find little pieces of paper and he, he designed these stamps who all have to do with escaping from the camp. And this is Karl Schwesig. Uh, and there are many other different of uh, what we can now, uh, mm, you can go on with the word. Yeah, here there's uh, some of images related to Ray Johnson, just uh, the the little bunny who had become his, uh, uh, his trademark symbol. And this was, uh, I mentioned before, the first uh, official uh, show at the Whitney Museum. And this is the official invite you see upstairs. And to see how Ray Johnson actually had this uh, love-hate relationship throughout his life uh, with the art um, 
business and uh, to the galleries. This rubber stamp you see between, uh, beneath it said, Dear Whitney Museum, I hate you, love, Ray Johnson. So at the same time, he has to sign love. But even if, and he was uh, quite a character, Ray Johnson, because he almost never had exhibition during his, his lifetime. And um, he, he liked to create this uh, uh, fake uh, organization where he would call in, uh, of course, uh, New York's uh, uh, correspondent school, but that was one among a hundred, because then he had the Buddha University and so on. So he used this rubber stand with, with fake uh, organization we had to become a stable in Melart. Uh, many Melartes used that. This is the guy that uh, uh, made me discover Melart. Uh, last year, was it was 100 years since he was born, and there were a lot of celebration around male artists around the world uh, for because what his name uh, yeah uh, again it's uh, Cabellini mm -hmm. and you can see here he has already uh, uh, he was already promoting his centenary when he was alive that's why we have to sort of honor him I personally made a collection of artist stamps uh, stamps by artists and I collect like two or three hundred pieces for him. This is the Decalogue of Calvellini, have yourself killed and become, uh, no, uh, kill someone in the name of Calvellini or kill Calvellini and uh, all, all the things. He used to perform and write his history on anybody's body and uh, he was an uh, older man already but uh, he had this vision that uh, male art in a way, th this networking strategy uh, was something of the future. and. Uh, I was lucky that he sort of told me, told me that. And uh, um, when I discovered male art, the first thing I did, I called him on the phone. And he said, why don't you come and visit in my place? I went to this very nice villa I had in Brescia, where he used to be one of the most uh, wealthy uh, art collectors in Italy. So I have this wonderful collection with pop art. Uh, uh, Novo realism, uh, you name it. And at the same time, he had this basement full of mail. And uh, he would just pull out address for me, and like he gave me this guy, he had this uh, Genesis PR, you say, write to this guy, he's mad, but he's a great guy. And so I collected all these addresses and started writing to everyone. This um, particular mail is from Edgardo Antonio Vigo in Argentina, which is a part of all another series of uh, networks uh, linked to visual poetry who um, are another of the branches who started mail art uh, because especially in the South uh, American countries but also uh, at the time I, I speak in the 70s or 80s when the wall was still up and uh, the mail fr from behind the iron curtain had problems to arrive uh, we have uh, then witnessed uh, last year at the project uh, you did two years ago in Berlin, how the Stasi used to, the police used to uh, select mail and uh, uh, fr uh, have uh, listed a lot of mail artists who some of them even had problems uh, uh, with the police and were incarcerated. And the same happened with, uh, unfortunately, uh, the son of Vigo was among the desaparecidos and uh, he had uh, it, it was not uh, so easy at the time to send uh, even so, such a simple images like the word peace uh, crossed over. Uh, that, uh, any of these signs could have been interpreted by the police as a form of, of dissent and uh, several of male artists uh, end up in jail like um, uh, Clemente Padin in Uruguay and uh, a few others and Clemente Padin, we were lucky enough that we uh, all the male artists uh, uh, sent a letter of protest uh, at the, the town municipality in uh, Montevideo where he, he was put in jail and we were lucky that he was released and uh, this happened in, in other cases and so even this uh, very uh, ephemeral form of art uh, um, that is that travels around the world with a little stamp on it uh, can be something dangerous, can put uh, in trouble uh, the freedom of the person who sent. Here is just uh, freewheeling. I put um, pieces of mail like this one, you see, is playing. You can play with the official mail. In, at this time, there was a, 
a governmental made with Malcolm X uh, and this guy, um, Bill Gaglione, uh, made fun of it by having blackmail and then a black stamp on the same envelope. This, uh, the same thing happens here. They had this uh, official stamp released of Elvis Presley, and so this uh, um, guy from New York uh, um, is called the Sticker Dude because he goes around giving stickers to everybody. He, he designed, he had this cover design with the fat Elvis, and you can put the, the stamp in the right place. And this is one of the thousand strange mailings I get in the mail still get today. Uh, uh, in this case, there are uh, stamps with the um, birds, and these are bird calls who were attached. So we had a lot of musical sounds coming from the envelope. And this goes against another rule of the, mm, there are a certain set of rules that are part of each government uh, um, post office system. One of the rules is you are not allowed to send uh, money through the mail. What this uh, uh, German mail artist did, he, he just glued it on, on the top of the envelope one dollar and it arrived. And then they tried with five and ten and fifty <laughs> to, to say when the postman would have stopped it. I don't remember the details, but it was fun and I got the one with one dollar anyway. And these are still about money. You can, this is, uh, yeah, well, we can just see how uh, mail art, of course, most mail artists like to play with the bureaucracy of mail, which is the stamp, the rubber stamp, the envelope, the postcard, the sticker, but also fake mail, art, fake money is something uh, which is particularly, this is the cover, I put a one, uh, I did this magazine called Arte Postale, which is with mail art in Italian, but with an exclamation mark, because I thought it was something exciting, so I have to put an exclamation mark there. And so one of the old saying about mail art was that mail art and money do not mix. And since uh, you like to play it a bit ironically, I made this issue, said no, ma money and art do mix. And even on the cover of the magazine, it was not just free, like most mail art magazines, but I had to glue a coin on each cover, so I was also paying money. And the project inside that it documented these particular issues was that I did send money to a lot of people around the world, and they had a series of options. Use this money to buy yourself a meal, or, or buy me a gift and send it back. They, they had all a set of options. And the, the other cover of the magazine used to see how also inside Millard there's a lot of concept to alterate how a magazine works. This one, Common Press, this is number 39 and was done in Germ Germany by uh, homosexual uh, dealing on that theme. But the first issue of Common Press was done in Poland by this Powell Petters, uh, who had the idea of a magazine that each time had a different director. So you have to apply to him, he would give you a number. So I did, personally I did uh, number 23 in 79 and my theme I decided was a political satire. But there were um, over 100 comp issues of, uh, of Common Press, all, each one of them done by, by a different male artist. This is another way how um, uh, artist magazine play on real magazine. Because of course, File, which was uh, created and become quite successful magazine in Canada by uh, General Image, a group of male artists that connected General idea, sorry, yeah, thank you. Uh, general idea by um, several artists who called it file, and then probably the next uh, uh, image is vile. This was done in San Francisco by Anna Banana and Bill Gaglioni, and uh, and then there were other variation because somebody in in Chicago made bile, and then it became the smile of uh, of ne neoism and so. Mm, uh, I, ju I just see, I, at a certain point, I, I had to sort of make uh, uh, for myself to put uh, into a frame all this material that I have collected. This one is nice because it's made like this and it says like a jail. And then when you open it, you untie the, the thing, probably in the next uh, image. It, it's free inside, so it's like uh, a pop-up thing that you open and close.
and this is more uh, South American Mila. I say at a certain point in the 90s, uh, I created this uh, small press with uh, a friend of mine, a uh, small pu publishing firm, uh, Pier Mario Ciani, called A Edizioni. The first book, by the way, was the first book by Luther Blissett, and uh, most of uh, we published like 30, 40 books, and most of them were related to uh, alternative forms of art. So he, he, it had been uh, about plagiarism, uh, and uh, the series I, I sort of tried to write was about male art. This was a general introduction where I speak uh, from the beginning the history of male art, and then we go more into uh, detail, and we di I just bring one about posters, but we made another book which was just about artist stamps, another one about, po uh, about rubber stamps, and the series could have gone on. And then uh, for particular projects, they were always cataloged, they could take all sorts of different forms with CDs inside, because um, of course, male art is a very free art form, and you can exchange whatever, and often the best uh, form of male art is very private, has nothing to do with the uh, exhibition or public projects. But then at the same time, sometimes you look back and make a, a compilation, a catalog of things you have exchanged with just one person. So th there's a lot of self-publishing into male art, and the reason I still uh, like to connect with what Tatiana is doing or others are doing around it, because uh, I feel that in the, in the archives around the world that, like mine, have collected already almost half a century of history of male art, there are a lot of interesting information that can uh, avoid that uh, uh, history repeats, continue to repeat itself. Because uh, when I discover the social networks, and uh, um, it was MySpace at first, and then, uh, of course, Facebook, and, and I, wh when I do that, I feel like I've done that before, and I've done that much better. Because it's not, you don't have a bar with the advertisement, you don't have to follow rules. You made your own rules with mail art, you know? And uh, so I think it, it would be interesting not to forget about the whole history of mail art and still go and see uh, what can still be useful to, uh, to the history of networking. And also because, as we said, the, the roots of all the multiple names and uh, um, um, other projects that are now in the digital, um, done in the digital way, have already done before on paper. Um, I have a question for yeah. you. Maybe you want to <coughs> explain also what uh, the people would find in this exhibition at uh, Schutz Gallery? Yeah, yeah. Mm, because for me it's very clear, but probably it's not. I, I asked to have um, a red line, a red tape that goes all around this small one little room where I put uh, um, uh, even there a little taste of what male art is. Over the red line, uh, one and a half meters and up to the, ce to the ceiling, I made a selection of images that we have seen a part of it. And so you will see a mosaic of images of um, historical male art that may be uh, one year old, but also 30 or 40 years old. And then below the red line, we glued the um, mail that we received after uh, a couple of months ago, we uh, sent out an uh, open call that anybody could send mail on the theme of uh, mail art disruption. So um, over 130 people sent stuff to the, to the gallery, and so you have in the same room uh, history of mail art and uh, mail art who has been created particularly for this uh, exhibition and also some of the mail artists send a lot of small badges or uh, leaflets which I put on the floor and so on the floor you can take uh, things and then in the middle of the room there is um, a project that I did uh, uh, 10 years ago it was a rubber stamp project where you uh, uh, actually, the, the audience have see shoes from different male artists, and on the heels of the shoes there is a rubber stamp. So you can create your own uh, A4 page when you can collect uh, 12 different rubber stamps. And then there's a new one which says, uh, disrupt it yourself, you can put also that. And then you take the page home as a souvenir. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we go 
we pass through the line of uh, <laughs> information deformation disruption. <laughs>